This is what rock bottom feels like. This is the 0-13 Adelaide Crows, with 16 consecutive losses spanning 388 days of winlessness. Just 57 games ago, this club was playing off in a grand final. Now, at this point, they look like they're going to be the first team in nearly six decades to have a winless season. You see, as a lifelong Adelaide Crows fan, this was torturous for me. I'd gotten used to almost success. It's great. No notoriety from failure, and the joy of making finals each year with only moderate expectations made our semi-final exits all the more acceptable. Then things got weird. For years the Crows had been just another team, with one of the best lists in the competition, yet little in the way of outright star power. They glided under the radar year on year, and no one really hated them, outside of Port fans at least. Two premierships found their way to West Lakes, and it really could have been more. There was no notoriety about this young, professional club with a rapidly passionate fan base. You really couldn't ask for a more pleasant, if unspectacular, club to support. And then, the worst decade to hit a football team happened. But to see where the Crows went wrong, we have to go back. Like, way back. Like, all the way to the start. And then back some more. After the 1982 relocation of the South Melbourne Swans to Sydney, as well as the establishment of the West Coast Eagles and Brisbane Bears in 1987, the Victorian Football League is making big moves to be the first Australian rules league to go fully national. The South Australian National Football League had made approaches to the VFL to enter an entity that would be known as the Adelaide Football Club, as well as independent approaches from two of the league's strongest teams in 1982, only for Jack Hamilton of the VFL to knock them back. The VFL had feasted in poaching SA's best, offering them a fortune to play in forward pockets as little trophies, so you can understand why they didn't want a full-on SA team to steal their thunder. Reportedly, a couple of clubs were intimidated by clubs like Norwood and Port Adelaide. Norwood had tried to make some independent entries throughout the rest of the 80s as the league's financial situation worsened. By 1989, three quarters of the SA NFL teams were recording financial losses and the league was starting to sink. The VFL was bigger than ever, with West Coast immediately becoming a force to be reckoned with. There's one team in the SA NFL that's looking to capitalise on this and turn the best state level side in the country to the best national level side. The Port Adelaide Magpies, Norwood's bitter rival, registered as a national team in 1985, and as they dominated the 1989 Grand Final, dropped hints that they'd really like to go national. The SANFL were twiddling their thumbs, as administrators do, not wanting to enter until 1993, while Port were having secret meetings in country towns and desperate to go big time right now. Norwood were seeing the storm brewing and seeing the negative reactions to Port's ambitions and withdrew their own interest in joining the VFL outright. When Port's bids went public, the other SANFL clubs saw this as an act of betrayal. No Port meant no league, they were like the Yankees in the MLB. Outrageously successful, prestigious in their reputation, and everyone who ain't them, hated them. If they left, that robbed the league of its biggest draw and would surely kill it. Glenelgan Norwood led a push against Port's bid, winning an injunction at the cost of half a million dollars of legal bills, which meant that, ironically, the clubs in the red had beaten the only profitable team in the sport at the sport of spending money on lawsuits. Then, the SANFL went mad, suing at anyone at Port who looked at them funny, before the AFL had to step in to stop them. The Adelaide Crows were thus formed and took what was essentially Port Adelaide's licence to play in what would now be known as the Australian Football League from 1991. The Magpies did get something, winning the last SANFL Premiership as the state's Premier League, but the coach of their vanquished foes that day had something very interesting to say. What a nice man. In fact, in a fitting move, he would be one of said individuals and be the first coach of the Adelaide Football Club. Bob Hammond, Glenelg legend Neil Curley, and SANFL administrator Murray Tippett were the men in charge of recruiting players from the nine member clubs of the league to form the Adelaide Football Club. And here are the 20 men who took to the field for the first AFL match to be hosted in South Australia. Tony McGuinness had played 100 games for Footscray in the VFL, more than the other three or four Foundation Crows who had played in that same league combined. 
This was the fact the Victorians seemed to focus on. Well, this, and the strength of the Crows' opposition that night. So naturally, against all that talent, the first five goals were kicked by Adelaide and... Wait, what? Yep. Although in the eyes of Victorians the Crows were rookies, they were anything but. Captain Chris McDermott was a 200 game veteran of a tough, competitive Glenelg outfit. Rodney Maynard had won Nord's Best and Fairest. Scott Lee won two at Centrals. Simon Tregenza had finished second in two league MVP counts. Nigel Smart, one of the youngest players, still had three years of senior level experience. Bruce Linder had won Geelong's goal kicking award once. And Jarman, Fielke, Hart, Marshall and Smith were all players well into SA Hall of Fame careers, with most of Adelaide's inexperienced players being twice as experienced than the average Hawthorne player. They were wolves in sheep's clothing. Hawthorne had underestimated them and paid the ultimate price. The pre-season Premiership favourites who would go on to fulfil that prophecy six months later got belted by 14 goals, embarrassed on a national stage by what they thought was a bunch of amateurs. Darren Jarman, the silkiest player to ever come out of South Australia, got embarrassed by his brother as Andrew got best on ground. David Marshall took two Brownlow votes, often described as a slick young midfielder on the night. Marshall was 30 in reality and was already a 300 game veteran of Glenelg. Rodney Maynard was named in the back pocket and scored more goals than a forward who got an end of a stadium name for his goalkeeping exploits. Jason Dunster was held to two by a bald, skinny youngster who received a shiny Brownlow vote of his own. Simon Tregenza made history by getting the first kick for his club, and maybe the only man to claim the first and second kicks in the club's history. The experienced man McGuinness got the first goal and three for the night, while his VFL counterpart Linda nailed four, both experienced men leading from the front. Now this surely meant that the Crows would be well on the way to success. Oh, oh boy. Carlton the next week, and indeed the rest of the competition, weren't going to repeat the Hawks' mistakes, and the Crows jutted to ninth and narrowly missing the finals. The old hands couldn't mix it in a slower, slightly stronger league for a whole season. Adelaide's woeful inconsistency was represented by two games. A 66 point win against the Bears, immediately followed by a 123 point thrashing at the hands of Collingwood, the 8th biggest negative form reversal of all time. The handball heavy game plan was taxing, and needed high tackling pressure if it went wrong, which the Crows didn't have. Adelaide also had trouble scoring, largely due to reigning McGarry medalist Scott Hodges missing half the season. Their goal kicking trophy went to a man who would end up in Adelaide's team of the decade, at full back. It's fitting his name was Rod, as Jamison was an odd fish. One of the smallest key position players you'll ever see, who started a trend at Adelaide of putting key players up front, seeing them succeed, and then shoving them in the back line. One of Jamison's 49 goals, though, will live forever in Crow's history, and after the siren winner against Fitzroy, on a weird and blustery day where Ross Lyon, of all people, turned into Superman. That, and Jamison being the Crow's leading tackler, summed up the oddness of the day. To 2020, it remains the only after the siren attempt to win in Adelaide's history, meaning Adelaide joins those other teams that made the VFL into the AFL, Brisbane and West Coast with perfect after the siren conversion records. Of course, there's that Mitch McGovern shot, but that was the draw, and he nailed that one too. The three Brownlow votes on that odd night at Football Park in 1991 went to Nigel Smart, and what a season he had. This bald fellow, only 21 when he debuted, went on to amass four more votes for the season, and it was him, not Adelaide's selection of 200 game veterans, or the eventual best and fairest Mark McCann, who was the first to represent the only team for all South Australians in the All-Australian team. He was an All-Star now, and he was going to act like one. For the 1992 pre-season, Graham Corns had arranged a little bonding session that involved Paul Blackburn, a motivational speaker, and I quote, whose favourite trick was to get so far inside people's minds that they could walk over hot coals by convincing them that the coals were cold. Smart had done some reading about this man, going so far as to actually suggest him to Corns, and Smart of course elected to go first. Unfortunately for him, the run that was only meant to be about a couple of metres long ended up being 12 yards. 
He ended up with first degree burns to both feet, and Bob Hammond called an end to the exercise before any other wise guy could immolate themselves. Although fitting that Blackburn had burned his feet black, Smart himself played in a trial match only a week later and was apparently fine, but that kind of set the tone for the next 30 years of the Adelaide Football Club. A plucky bravado, but unaware that it was burning itself. Corns was partially justified as the Crows lifted to 11 wins, narrowly missing the finals again. This was positive as Mark McCann, who somehow came a roaring 12th in a Brownlow medal, was all at sea in 1992. He had essentially been replaced in the ruck though, and Sean Wren took McCann's record one better by climbing into that Brownlow medal top 10. Wren was able to do what led Scott Wind and Jim Steins to Brownlows by being a ruckman that gave himself support with over 15 disposals per game. His third and final three-vote performance for the year was the last match against Collingwood, where he destroyed the big monster Monk Horse and tried to scrape the Crows into the final single-handedly. Wren lost the best and fairest though, as Chris McDermott had a season that no Crow would eclipse for 25 years. To average 30 disposals in a game in 2020 means you're an elite ball gatherer. It's exceptional, but not exactly rare. In fact, here is every 30 disposal per game season in the AFL's national era. To do it now is great. To do it in 1992 is almost unheard of, and McDermott made 30 look small. Averaging 32 disposals, leading disposals even after missing the finals, is insane, but the club captain made it look easy, pioneering the run-and-gun, handball-heavy midfield style that is so common nowadays. He remains the second fastest ball gatherer to 50 games in AFL-VFL history. So he, as well as Vice Captain Tony McGuinness and young defender Ben Hart, got into the 1992 All-Australian side, and no, none of them burned their feet on hot coals in that off-season. Perhaps as a result of that, Adelaide exploded in 1993, but that was down to one man. He played a few games the previous season and kicked bags of 5, 5 and 7, but he was as sporadic as he was brilliant. Some commentators didn't see a huge future for him. Then an injury to Scott Hodges forced Adelaide to start him in round 1 of 1993, where he exploded onto the scene with 10 goals against a hapless Richmond. The world had officially been introduced to what Tony Modra could do. He kicked six the next week, he missed the next game, but got another six on his return. Every week he not only scored goals, but scored a heap. He got another 10 against North Melbourne, and 14 over the next two weeks. When the Crows went up against Richmond again in round 16, he scored 13, which is a club record still to this day. He ended up with a ridiculous 129 goals for the season, level with Gary Ablett Sr. in only Modra's second season. And yet, he didn't win the Brownlow medal. Forwards kicking insane amounts of goals were taken for granted back then, and Modra got a piddling 11 votes. He didn't even win the Coleman, as Ablett got 123 during the home and away season, with Modra only getting 119. It was one of the last great goal kicking performances. In fact, it was the last great goal kicking performance. Ablett would equal it, but no one ever beat it, and no one ever will. These 119 home and away goals basically got Adelaide to the finals all by himself. Seriously, 36.65% of all Adelaide's goals came from the godlike mullet owner. He scored over a hundred more goals than the next highest scoring Crow. There's never been a season in club history where a goal scorer has dominated quite so much. Incidentally, the next three seasons belong to Tony Modra, Tony Modra, and Tony Modra. The only other men in the same universe are 1999 Darren Jarman and a certain small forward who I'll get to later. Tony McGuinness and Sean Wren provided some supporting roles to get the Crows past Collingwood again in round 22, but this time it meant something. The Crows had made the finals for the first time, and oh boy did they make it a series to remember. Their first task was overcoming those pesky hawks that they'd so readily destroyed in 1991. After a tight start, the Crows obliterated the hawks in the second quarter, before very nearly throwing the game right back into Jason Dunstan's hands. Adelaide faced a tough Carlton side the next week, and immediately threw away a small early lead by missing five shots in the second turn. This match was intensely frustrating as Carlton's defenders rushed a record 10 behinds to bring the Crows' final score to 8 goals 20. An inaccurate Tony McGuinness, Wayne Wiedemann and Sean Tasker, as well as an ineffective Tony Modra, 
were put to the sword by Craig Bradley as the Crows lost by three goals, having had seven more scoring attempts and issuing their fourth least accurate half in their history. The result? Carlton were through to the grand final. But Adelaide had one more chance. They hit the MCG running against Essendon, booting seven goals in the first quarter and having 24 scoring shots in the first half. Since 1991, this is usually being done only about six to ten times per season. Andrew Jarman later said that it was the best football they'd played in the club's history. They were up by seven goals at halftime, and a place in the grand final, and indeed a premiership, looked all but assured. Which is why it's so goddamn heartbreaking that Essendon did this. Basic things fell apart for the Crows. Jarman missed a sitter. Youngster Marco Shiro was being pounded by Darren Buick of all people. The Crows gave some silly free kicks away and allowed Wanganeen far too much of the ball. In the end, a grand final appearance disappeared. Adelaide had been destroyed. This is every match to have been won by a team that was down by six and a half goals or more at the halftime break. There's not many of them. Hell, 24 shot first halves rarely result in anything less than a 100 point demolition. These were all the teams that had those great first halves but still allowed a hundred whole points through their end. Again, astonishingly rare, and Adelaide still stands pretty much all alone. The only teams that had done that before, a 1992 Essendon team and a 1993 Geelong team, who were beaten by that same squad that did Adelaide in, and the Bombers were the only ones to ever lose from this position again. Even crazier is that if you go back across the history, at every 20 shot first half that turned into a 30 shot scoring game, the only two losers are that Adelaide prelim squad and yet another Essendon side. But Adelaide had just done it on their biggest ever stage. And what caused this you may ask? A fart. I wish I was kidding. A fart caused by Mark Bickley's reaction to some of Greg Anderson's Nasashi supplements emptied the dressing room caused Corns to lose his grip on proceedings and caused, at the time, the ninth biggest comeback in the league's history. Still, the signs were promising and as long as Bix could hold his bowels in check, the Crows could rebound. The Graham Corns era was about to go into full swing. And the Corns era is over. Modra kicked 13 in the opening round and 70 for the season, which was a fair effort. But again, the next best was in the mid-twenties, and the Crows scored the third fewest goals in the league. McGuinness and McDermott again gave it their all, but that was thanks to the tireless rucking of Sean Wren, the 1994 Adelaide best and fairest and league leader in hitouts. The rest of the squad was regularly rotated, upsetting their harmony and rhythm. And the second stringers they brought in? Jesus, they were bad. Corns left at the end of the season, the 1993 finals run seen as an anomaly rather than a true indication of how good the Crows side could be. They'd missed their window. The Crows now needed a coach who would lead them forward, a Malthouse, a Sheedy or a Blight type. They instead got the bloke who took the controls at Fitzroy and took great pains in steering them into a nosedive. The Crows again underperformed in 1995, with the sole interesting thing being Matthew Connell becoming the only player, even to this day, to win the club best and fairest in his first season at the Crows, also being the least experienced to do so for any club, with only three games worth of experience beforehand. The fact that he was able to limp there on the back of such a dreadful statistical season shows how poor those 95 Crows were. Modra missed almost half the year, managing only 42 goals. He did win gold the year, but look at it. That's a free kick against him right there. And it's just a scrappy play, representative of Adelaide's year as a whole. It was bloody awful. But the Crows had made some great acquisitions. Vardy, Edwards, Johnson, Ellen and Goodwin were all drafted, and all those will be names you'll hear a fair bit later. Peter Caven, Troy Bond and Kim Costa were lovely trade acquisitions, but there were two big fish across 94 and 95 that the Crows landed that helped them push to the next level. Andrew Jarman had lined up on his brother in his first AFL game way back in 1991. Now, for 1996, they would play alongside each other in their home state at the cost of pick 25 and surplus key back Sean Wellman. The best ball user in the competition was at Westlakes. Now, the sacking of Corns had certainly seemed rash, but it opened the door for perhaps the best trade in AFL history. Corns' loyalty to the development of young centre-half forward Chris Groom 
would have kept him at the Crows, but a ruthless Robert Shaw sent him to Fremantle to pry from them a wiry young Indigenous player who was playing in the SANFL at the time. Room would end up playing seven games in an injury riddled spell before being offloaded. His replacement would go on to be perhaps the greatest player in the history of the Adelaide Football Club, and maybe the best halfback ever to play the game, who would change the course of football in the state forever. Thanks for watching everyone, hope you enjoyed that and I really do mean that because there's another five parts after this so uh, strap in for the ride. Uh, if you did like it, uh, you know, feel free to give it a like and subscribe to the channel to uh, not miss the next few parts and uh, hopefully part two will be out in a couple of weeks so catch you guys then.